Michelle Dunway, welcome to the Undraped Artist Podcast. Hey, Jeff. It's great to be here. I love your podcast. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, we obviously know each other, but I'm excited because I get to learn a lot more about you today. Um, and the first thing I want to know is something I feel like I should have known before, but how did you decide to become an artist and how did you get into this field? And when did you decide to become an artist? Um, yeah, for me, I feel like art kind of chose me more than, you know, me it. Um, my very first memory as a human being at uh, around two years old was seeing an art book and it was seeing a Michelangelo book, I think probably on the Sistine Chapel or I remember red chalk drawings of, of figures. And when I was little, the book really appeared like it was four feet tall to me. Um, in reality, I'm sure it was just a little book, but it was just my perspective at such a young age. And I was at someone's house and the older brother came in who was probably seven or eight and he closed the book and he said, you're too young to look at that. And I distinctively remember having such a determined thought at that young age that no one was going to prevent me from looking at that. Huh. Wait, why were you too young? Because it was and nudes? Or because um, what was no, it? No, I think it was just because it was an adult book and I'm two and I can't read. You know? Oh, really? Interesting. I think it was probably the parents' book. It wasn't like a, a kid's book. So. Oh, okay. But I, I can't even believe you remember something at two years old. That's mind blowing. I think my earliest memory was maybe four years old, maybe three, but two seems early to me. That's kind of unbelievable. I I don't, I, yeah, I don't know what the normal age is. Um, just for me, it was such a strong feeling. I had such a connection with something. And I think, um, you know, I had an art teacher that said all artists are a bit rebellious and mavericks by nature. And so to me, I was like, don't tell me that I can't look at that. I'm going to look at that. Um, but I was really fascinated with, I just remember the faces and the hands. And, um, and I just like really soon after that, my mom tells this story where I was with her in just like a regular um, grocery store. And I wanted a little comic book. It was a little Archie Digest. Mm -hmm. You know, they have those sometimes at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And um, she didn't want to buy it for me because I, was, I wasn't I was reading yet. And I just was so adamant that I wanted it. And I told her, I was like, I don't even remember asking for it. She said, you were just tugging on my paint, pant leg and you just wouldn't let it go. So she reluctantly bought it for me. And she said, I immediately, you know, grabbed a pencil when I got home and started tracing the faces and the hands in the comic book. And, um, and it's funny because I actually thought maybe my mom was exaggerating on my age, but I recently found the comic book when I was helping them move. And it's all kind of in tatters because I had it forever and, um, and used to draw from it when I, up till like seven or eight. And it is by the date I was two years old. That is when insane. I can't even and get over that. And when I got a little old, <laughs> what? I can't get over that. I can't even get over that you have a memory that early and about art for that matter. It just, I, I feel like it just like gripped me, you know, and it mm -hmm. was like maybe the first time, like uh, first time having a memory, first time maybe feeling such intense emotion as a kid, like being extremely inspired. And maybe that's what causes our first memory. I don't know. Um, I'd be interested to, you know, ask a neuroscientist about that. Yeah, but, no kidding. Um, I remember though, when I was a little older, like five and six, I would actually trace over the faces and then quickly, I do that a couple times and then move my hand to a blank sheet of paper and let the muscle memory draw the face on the belt. How black, in the world paper. did you even think to train yourself that way at that age? You had, it no was idea. just instinctual. I'm assuming you had no teachers telling you that or anything. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, I was at the age where you cut out construction things and use Elmer, Elmer's glue, you know, in first grade. So, but I was always drawing and my notebooks in school are filled with, filled with drawings. So, um, I didn't know being an artist was a thing, but I knew I had to create and draw. And, you know, I, I, I look back, especially when I found all of these books from grade mm -hmm. school, um, at my parents' house. And I looked back and could see on all of my notebooks drawing things and having like very, a very strong determination. Like at that age, at six or seven, it was like Wonder Woman. I was drawing Wonder Woman a lot. And I, and I found a drawing where I was trying to draw her boot and, you know, like the space between the heel of the boot and around yeah. the heel. 
and I couldn't get it right. It looked all distorted. And I did it like 10 times in a row until yeah. I got it right, which probably at that age took me hours. Yeah. You know, I imagine but just sitting there, but I think it was, um, it was just a strong desire in me. And a, a student recently asked me, they're like, what do you think the secret to some of your success is? And the first thing that came to mind is I just never give up. Really? You know, I don't have all the answers. None of us do, you know, um, students sometimes think we do or they're as a student. When I was a student, I really thought that the artists I admired and the teachers I had had all the answers. And once I got all the answers, paintings would just fall off the end of my brush and it would be effortless and fun. And um, I didn't realize, you know, how much work it is, it, but it's joyful work. It's still really fun. Um, but it takes that determination of not giving up and, and realizing that you may not have all the answers when you begin a painting, but you learn to ask yourselves questions during the painting process that lead to the answers. And it's a magnificent journey. Right. Um, so, wow. That, yeah. So would you call it grit, that personality trait? Yeah. yeah maybe. So when you, so never giving up. I mean, if it's always fun, why would anyone give up? Right? Well, it's not <laughs> always fun. So if you notice, I use the word joyful. Yeah, like it's joyful work, but it's still work. Yeah. And, you know, I remember at age, maybe 22, watching uh, my first Richard Schmidt, like VHS tape <laughs> of his mm -hmm. first demo. And he talked in the end and was saying, um, painting is always hard work. It's just as you get older, you turn out less of the turkeys, but it's, it's never easy. And I remember I felt so like shocked hearing Richard Schmid say this. So yeah, thought, that's hard to imagine, right? Easy one day. <laughs> you mean it's always going to be this, this much of a, it's not so much of a struggle, but it's, it takes focus and concentration. Yeah. You know? Um, and you know this, you know, oh, yeah. as well. I had a student once in my class who was an actual brain surgeon. And he said painting a face and a head was just, took us just as much focus as doing actual brain surgery. He just didn't have to worry about killing anyone, only insulting them. That's so funny. <laughs> I had a similar experience because I had a student who was a doctor as well. And he said that studying art was harder than medical school. I thought, wow, yeah. yeah, that puts in perspective because I, how often, I mean, I know you teach, we've both taught for years, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you get this, but on occasion, probably more times, let me think about this. No, not more times than not. I'd say about 30% of the time students come in and they're really ambitious and you know, you got to hand it to them for the ambition, but they're like, okay, I want to get through your whole program. I want to become a professional artist. I've only got two years to do it and let's make it happen. I'm like, Two years, two years. <laughs> like, so if, if you came into my studio and said, I want to be Yo-Yo Ma in two years, I want to learn how to, yeah. play the, to, to play the cello and be in this, you know, the, in an orchestra for a major city in two years, you would expect me to laugh my head off, right? But for some reason, a lot of people think that it's just going to happen overnight. Like, it, there's no work involved. And to me, like, I have met, some people where they accelerate really fast, they assimilate information that just, it's mind boggling, um, you know, prodigies and such. But I think even thinking about how long it's gonna take, whether you think it's gonna take 20 years or two years or whatever is the wrong thing to be thinking yeah. about because you cannot put a timestamp on excellence, right? I think that um, I've seen an artist, I was just, you know, teaching a class earlier today and I have a couple artists that the change in their work in six months is is mind blowing. Yeah. And the other students were remarking on that. And it's because they're really focused and they're really um, pushing themselves to be bold and try new things and step out of their comfort zone. Um, but again, you know, and, and I'll often teach classes where it's we're working on paintings for several weeks um, over time and then checking back in with the artist and excellence can take time. Sometimes something can come off the end of your brush really beautifully. I mean, I think there's so much power in like an a la prima sketch, but some paintings take weeks or months. And mm -hmm. it's just, I feel like thinking about how long it's going to take, it would be like meeting the love of your life and thinking, how long is it going to take to fall in love? Is mm -hmm. it going to take this long? Is it, you're missing, you're missing it. Yeah. Missing that's a good point. I like that analogy. Yeah. 
So, and the purpose is to fall in love with what you're doing, right? Yeah. So it's like when you're in the moment and really not thinking about what you're going to be doing an hour from now, what you were doing yesterday, what you need, a, what email you need to send, you're just in the moment of creating. That's when your genius can come out and you lose time and you're in that zone. And I think it's so important to like just be focused on that, the beauty of that present moment, because that's what we're trying to capture, right? In a, in a portrait, a moment. Yeah. Yeah, you got me thinking about a lot of stuff here. So when you said, for some reason, <laughs> when you said that, let your genius come out, um, that that's an interesting way of phrasing it. What, what do you mean by that exactly? Let your genius come out. Well, I think every human being on this planet has inherent genius, right? Whether they're creative in the arts like we are or in any other kind of medium. Um, and I really believe that when... A lot of that comes from, yes, learn technique, studying in your field. Um, and just to make it more concise, we'll talk about just art that, you know, yes, learning how to paint and learning how to mix colors and, and all of the technical skills it takes to be a painter. But I think there's an inherent genius. And usually that has to do more with mindset and how we take in the world and how we perceive things. Um, I always, you know, tell my students is that your ability to pay attention to the things that matter and selectively edit out the things that don't is part of your superpower as an artist. And I think all artists have that. I, I don't know about you, but I can remember when I was a little kid looking at things and seeing things and maybe things that other people didn't notice. And, and there was a time when I had frustration that I didn't have the skill to flesh that out into reality. And so that's why you go to school and you learn and you and you spend time in front of the model and you paint, you know, miles of canvas to learn that. But then I think part of um, tapping into your calling, your genius, um, which I believe just everyone has that, is getting back in touch with, with that um, childlike intention of why you wanted to paint, what mm. you wanted to say, right? Because we learn, it's like you learn your ABCs and then you write your novel. So we learn our technique, but it, we can have the best technique, but if we don't know what we want to say in our paintings, that's that can be a huge detriment. And so often I find that even when I'm kind of coaching someone in art or mentoring them that they'll be like, well, I don't really know what to, I want to say. And so I'll ask them questions about, well, what's important to you in life day to day? What are the things that make you catch your breath? What are the things that frustrate you? What are the things that inspire you? And that will help you find, you know, what your purpose is through your art. And I think that's true across every creative profession. And sometimes we just have to get all of our, any negative thinking, any sense of lack, any of that ego stuff out of the way to always be, to me, like be humble in front of the majesty that is creation and life and also have at the same moment the confidence to know if you have a desire in your heart that especially one that's like i feel divinely put there in some way or form that you are meant to ha make it happen it's meant to happen i feel like our dreams as human beings are like kind of like a preview like coming attractions of a movie for your life and um and what I find so many times when I teach and I had to work on this in myself is just like uh, students lacking the belief that they can do it. We think, oh, we look at Michelangelo and Sargent and Da Vinci and we think, you know, they were superhuman, but they were just human beings working through their fears, working through their struggles to create the best that was within them. And it's no different from anyone living today. Um, and so I always, you know, to me, teaching is part of my calling. I know it's part of your calling as well, too, um, because I want to help people get that and kind of clear the blocks. That's their inherent genius. You know, it always makes me think of the quote someone said about, you know, or Michelangelo said about that the, the angel is in the marble. He just has to chip away everything that's not it to reveal it. He's not actually creating the sculpture. And you know, I feel we do the same things, right, in life and in art, where maybe the genius is that angel within us, and we have to chip away everything that gets in the way of that. Hmm. Yeah, okay, I like that. 
So it's what we have to offer the world. It's what we have to say. It's our unique voice, our unique perspective. And our sense of appreciation. You know, I think, I really think creativity is birthed from an appreciation that has to flow out of us in some way. And that's creativity across the board, whether you're a writer, whether you're cooking a meal, whether you're writing poetry, whether you're painting mm -hmm. um, or doing a podcast, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like something is inspiring you as you ingest it and appreciate it in the world and you have to share it and you have to get it out. Um, like you could have had all these conversations privately. I mean, you could have called me, we could have hung out for two hours and talked, but you're wanting to share it with the world. Right. Like, you know, why, why is that? Because it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> because, I it's so yeah. Weird. Because, yeah. I mean, I have no financial benefit to this. That's for dang sure. But yeah. it's, um, it's, yeah, I just, because this, I'm, I'm doing something, it's like everything else we do that we, that we're ambitious about. I mean, maybe I shouldn't speak for other people, but I, I think you probably could relate to this. Mm -hmm. But there's always got to be a higher purpose. No, I mean, you don't want to be. I don't want to be an artist just because I get to draw and paint every day. There's got to be something bigger than that to it. Yeah. It's got, there's got to be. And with the podcast, yeah, I like all the, I like talking to people. I'm a social person, but the, but the biggest reason is because it's, I want to make something that I wish I already had, that was already out there that I, I wish I had. Right. Yeah. You know, so um, exactly. Yeah. You know, that's one of the main reasons I teach because I want to teach what I couldn't find right. when I was looking for a teacher. Same. And I found eventually, but, um, but even if you find it, so there are other good podcasts, for example, there are other great teachers out there, yeah. but those teachers can't teach everybody. Yeah. Right? And you're so, also sharing from your new, unique experience right. and your perspective. And it, I think it starts with your appreciation, appreciation for life and, other artists and you know and then wanting to share that yeah oh, which totally. you know, for me portraits are appreciating the person that's in front of me and seeing how we're connected and how we're you know similar yet unique and that just fascinates me yeah you know something you said earlier frankly i don't even remember what it was but it brought up a thought um and uh it is you know i've often thought the only reason, well, not the only reason, but one of the main reasons I want to be a good craftsperson um, is to be good enough to get out of the way so that the stuff I have to say is not clouded by my weak craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's exactly. like, yeah, exactly. it, it's why, because if why, it's yeah. people, if, if you, if you say something as a poet with a terrible vocabulary, it's hard, even if you have something incredible to say, not a lot of people are going to listen. Or if you sing a song yeah. with a terrible voice, even if it's got the most be most beautiful message, not a lot of people are going to listen, right? Yeah. If you paint a painting terribly, not a lot of people are going to look at it. It doesn't matter yeah. what you're trying to say, you know, so. Yeah, you could have great emotion in the eyes, but if the mouth is off center, that's yeah, No, or just like you could be them. saying something, you know, about the world. Um, whatever it might be, like right now I'm painting the crucifixion and my, my main goal is just to be good enough to get out of the way so people can appreciate how significant that is and not be distracted by how terribly I paint. Right. Um, that's the idea well, is to paint, course. to paint You're well. You're an amazing enough. painter. You don't paint terribly. No, so. but you know what I mean? It's just, well, thank you. But <laughs> you know what I mean? Classes, don't say that about yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what no, I mean? I totally it's just like, get out of the way, get out of the way so that your message can come through, like be good enough yeah, so I, that you're out of the way. Exactly. And I think that's why we learn technique. And then I think taking it a step for, further, you know, going into what you were asking about the inherent genius thing is that, yeah, we have to get ourselves out of the way, like a little bit, get our, you know, negative thinking or, you know, ego out of the way and um, learn our skills so that everything is painted competently and in the right place and has the right anatomy and, and skeletal structure and all of that and um, color harmonies are working and such. But I, I think that there's that step, that little step beyond. And I used to have a teacher, one of my first art teachers, he said, it's great to be a craftsman and to a craftsman works with their head and their hands and their heart. But if you want to be a master, you have to bring in your spirit. To all of that and that really stuck with me when i heard it at like 20 years old is that i think 
opening up to kind of your spiritual intuition, for lack of a better word, of like where to put the brushwork or where to, you know, what you want to emphasize, what you want to, de you know, de-emphasize to really capture the essence of what you're trying to convey, either, you know, emotionally or visually in the painting. When you open up to that, that really kind of invites that genius to flow. Hmm. No, I get that. I Yeah, that's great. I love that point. You know, I've I can't uh, wait to see your crucifixion painting, by the way. Yeah, well, and thank you for saying I'm a good painter because it is the freaking hardest painting thing. I've ever done. Um, I'm actually doing two crucifixion. Yeah, it's so hard. There's it's so hard. Um, because I'm really but feeling like, what I was saying, where I just have to be good enough to not screw this thing up, screw this story up, you know what I mean? Um but, Yeah, and I'm sure when you get to like the end stages of that painting and getting close to what you want to achieve. And of course it's going to be executed really beautifully with your skill as an artist. And then, you know, putting yourself in the mindset of what you want the person to feel that's witnessing that for the right. first time. Right. What do you want that viewer? The, what do you want? What do, transformation do you want that to happen to happen in them when they see it? And then that like takes it to a whole nother level when you're finishing off the painting. Yeah. So I, I, um, I think I mentioned this on another podcast with another artist, but, uh, um, we had talked about the definition of art and my definition has always been the combination of three things, good mm -hmm. craftsmanship, good design, and a good idea, right? If you've got just good craftsmanship, you're a craftsman. If you've got just yeah. good design, you're a designer. If you've got just a good idea, you're a human with a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I kind of like what you're saying here. It's almost like you could add something. I don't know if you agree with that definition or not, but that's not the point. I totally do. Oh, okay, I appreciate I totally that. Do. But the, but you could add to that definition, um, this idea of genius, or you, you mentioned, you, you mentioned spirit as being synonymous, something bigger than all three of those things. Yeah. Yeah. I think spirit is, um, all encompassing, you know, of all of those things. Okay. Right. It's like who we really are, who, who, you know, who we were are now and who we will be beyond, you know, it's just, right, it, right. it's really what makes, makes up, um, what moves our, moves our spirit, so to speak every day in life and why we choose to paint what we want to paint. And, um, so yeah, I think it's really important is it, it, it again goes into the, why are you doing it? Right. right. Because, I know for myself, after going to art school and learning certain techniques, it's so fun, you know, right? There's the art nerd in me that loves the technical qualities of like putting on a dry brush stroke or putting on a palette knife stroke or getting the, you know, form to turn with a color temperature or getting the light to bounce off because I get some texture in the brush stroke. And it not only is the right value and color temperature, but it actually physically bounces the light, bounces the light off in a way when the viewer stands in front of it. Those kind of things are like, the techie things that, you know, we love as mm -hmm. because tech, being a technician is part of being an artist. Um, but if that spirit doesn't shine through, if I don't capture that essence in that person's face of their spirit shining through and giving a sense to the viewer that that person is sitting in front of them, then I've kind of missed my mark, right? Or haven't taken it far enough. And so I feel like um, one of the things that I realized and I heard this just when I was painting once and I had a movie on in the background mm -hmm. and it was like some background dialogue in the movie. And it was like a bell went off when I heard it because I was working on a face and I was, I had wanted to, I was almost done and I was going to be sending it to a show. And it was just like, you know how it is where it's like the last 5% you're just spinning and you just can't quite finish it. Yeah. And I was getting frustrated and then the face started to look frustrated you know, and, and I was oh, losing whoa. the expression. Oh, whoa. I've never experienced you know? that. That's interesting. Oh, no. I all the time. Like, it just, it almost starts to mirror um, your, really? your emotions. Oh, maybe I haven't. I just so, never noticed it. I'll have to pay uh, attention yeah. to that. It's it's really funny. And um, so, because it almost, you can start to see it form like a cartoon, like the, the painting will huh. change based on whatever you're doing because it's subconscious, right? Right. And I heard this background dialogue of people talking and there was music and it was very faint and I stopped and I rewound it, listened, it said, you have to embody the emotion you want to convey. And 
of course they were talking, they were reading from a book. It was like in a Pride and Prejudice movie. It had nothing to do with art. But I realized I need to embody the emotion that I want to convey in the portrait. You can't paint someone looking inspired by being frustrated. Yeah. And it just took it to a new level. And I think a lot of times when I'm helping students and they're struggling, I'll ask them, what are you thinking right now? And they're thinking like, I don't think I can do this. And you and you can't do it thinking from that mindset. So you really have to, you know, we know as artists, you have to keep your palette clean, right? Muddy color in your palette will make it into your painting. So you, if you get muddy color in your palette, wipe it off. But I take it further and say, you have to keep the palette of your mind clean. Mm. Well, and negative thoughts will make it either way into your painting. And, um, you know, just going back to that, you know, finding your genius, or I would say even allowing your genius, because I think everyone's born with it, maybe not technical genius, but they're born with a way of perceiving the world that is um, unique to them, while mm -hmm. at the same time connects to all other human beings. It's why we can listen to a piece of music or we can read poetry that has nothing to do with our lives, and it takes our breath away. And I don't know about you, but then I go, when I see someone else's genius in another creative medium, it inspires me to be a better artist. Oh, absolutely. And it doesn't matter if I'm inspired by another artist or it can be like someone who, you know, like I said, writes poetry or does something else that's in a completely different medium. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's like, a, you know, a quest for excellence or excellence over perfection. That is to me really the key because I think a lot of artists are perfectionists. And mm -hmm. perfection is really kind of limiting and fear-based and excellence is really spirit-based and um, steeped in kind of like allowing genius to show through. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You're bringing up a lot. I, I don't even getting on the. No, you're bringing <laughs> up lots of thoughts. I want to flesh something out here. One thing you said, because sure. this is something that's always fascinated me as a portrait painter and I have lots of unresolved Maybe unresolved is the wrong word, but I've I've lots of thoughts um, about this that aren't necessarily concrete, you know. But you had mentioned uh, catching the spirit of a person. You'd said, you know, when you get in a bad mood, it comes off in their portrait, and so on and so forth. But I want to focus mm -hmm. on that catching the spirit of a person. What sure. is it as technically? Well. Maybe not technically, but what is it that you do to see past the physical features of a person? The, just the simple biological shape of a nose, shape of a mouth, shape of the eyes that moves past that into something more significant, which you call the spirit of the person. Yeah. So, I mean, of course we have to get the, the shape of the right. eyes, nose and mouth and the things. And, um, I always think of it in stages, right? Um, like constructing a house. Okay. And you have to, uh, frame the house first and then build the walls and stuff that, um, you know, getting the, the features in the right place and then going for likeness and then going for the emotion. And I think. Wait, so is that it? Is the spirit of the person, the emotion? Is that what you're saying? No, I wouldn't say it is. Okay. It's, so the emotion is part of to me capturing the spirit of the person, but it's not the entirety okay. of the spirit of the person. And for me, like how I think of it, you know, everyone has their unique physical attributes, right? right? And I love that. It's one of the things I like to paint because no two people are alike. Even like identical twins have little differences. And so we're all as unique as like snowflakes, so to speak, and, you know, our fingerprints. And um, and then going beyond that, no one has, you know, your exact life experience. No one has the exact same experience growing up or everyone comes from different places. And that's part of our uniqueness. Um, that's internal, but we have this uniqueness physically that is fascinating to paint. But within that, the spirit of a person, I think our spirits are so similar. And our spirits being that we want to do, you know, something meaningful with our lives. We want to love and be loved. We want to have beautiful moments. Um, we all go through challenges. We go through adversity. We go through the overcoming of those adversities. Um, we in, in, are inspired and we inspire others, right? And 
all of those things are that make us human dwell beneath the surface of things. It has nothing to do with how we look. Okay. And it's just in here. And it's the same in someone that lived a thousand years ago or someone that lives on another continent, right? These, these, the emotional journeys we go as go through as human being that our spirit goes through and our spirit is always like growing and evolving um, and becoming more enlightened. And so to me, to tap into that and catch a glimpse of that on the canvas is, is very important. It's what I strive for. Um, and I think you have to just see it in the other person first and recognize that and connect with that before you even try to paint it. Right. And that's just part of like, it's part of being, you know, compassionate, part of, um, really seeing who the other person is, right? Like I can look at you and say like, oh yeah, Jeff, I know you, we've hung out at Portrait Society, you have brown air, brown hair. I'm not sure what color your eyes are. You know, those are things that mm -hmm. are like, if I were painting you, I would notice those things. But I know you have a kind and generous spirit. I know you have a witty humor just from being around you. I know things about like your, you've shared about your struggles, your overcoming of, you know, medical issues, your, um, faith you you know shared parts of that so even though i haven't gone through those exact same experiences even though we're different people even though we're different genders i've gone through those same experiences emotionally and spiritually with just a different set of parameters right different there there might be different um um factual elements to it right but I've experienced that because I'm a human being and you're a human being and that's what connects us. Okay. And so that underlying facet of humanity, and that's what to me shines out of someone's eyes when you talk to them, mm -hmm. right? When you're just having a cup of coffee with someone and they're telling you a story and telling them something, um, you see so many, a myriad of emotions going across their, their face, just with their eyes, sometimes their hand gestures and everything. That's so moving to me. So that's as important, if not more important for me to capture in the portrait than their likeness. Okay. Because, and I feel like, you know, do, doing a likeness to me is important if you're doing like a portrait commission or you really want to paint that particular person. But say if you're in a two hour, you know, open painting session and you don't maybe have time to get that, maybe you'll hit the likeness, maybe you won't. Um, but after getting the drawing, getting the, you know, color, color temperature, edges, some of the technical stuff, I go after getting some of that, the essence of the person. And I usually try to talk to the models during the break. I learned that from being around Richard Schmidt and painting with him. He always engaged the models, asked them about their life history, connected with them on that level. And, um, and I think it subtly becomes imbued in the painting. And that, and then the side effect of that is I think when someone sees that painting say in a gallery and it's someone they don't know but they want to buy that and hang it on their wall it's because they're connecting with something they sense within that person and something that connects to their experience their own experience as a human being mm -hmm. right it's under the surface of things yeah okay so i totally get what you're saying okay um, i was like does that answer your question no it it does it does but just to make sure i do i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you if this is what you mean so i earlier said so is spirit emotion and um and then you expounded further but it sounds like it sounds like what you're saying is though that while spirit isn't equal to emotion that you you are capturing it through the emotions that come out because of that person's character and spirit Right. Yeah, part of it. It's like right. emotion is a component of spirit, but not the totality. Right. There's, but that's yeah, as the artist, kind of, that's what you're seeing, right? You're like, yeah, right. Okay. Spirit to me, someone's spirit is their inherent beingness. Right. You know, their presence, right? Going back to like, it's to me capturing that presence of what it feels to kind of connect with that person. Um, and then there's something like... And it's hard to really put into words, but, you know, Richard Schmidt said this where he said, every portrait you do isn't just about the sitter. It's also self-portrait of your experience of that moment and the, your experience of that person. And I truly believe that. And, um, and that happens subconsciously. It just happens intuitively 
in the painting, even if we're not intentionally putting that in. As I've become like, you know, older and, and wiser <laughs> and more experienced as an artist, that's something I look for to put in. And so it's like connecting to their presence as a human being, making sure that person is seen and valued, listening to them, really just enjoying just being with them and kind of the painting as being a byproduct of that. And again, it's something I really learned by watching Richard and Nancy. They weren't like fussing with the model to get a good painting. They were enjoying the experience of getting to know someone and the painting was a natural progression from that. And it sounds the same, but it's a different intention. Yeah. And I think one that allows your genius to come through and it also allows you to connect with a human being, that person sitting in front of you that is maybe someone you've never met before. And that connection between us as human beings that's that's what's important in life. To me, paintings are a visual example of that. Poetry is a written example of that. Bikic is an audible example of that, but it's all about connecting Yeah. as human beings, right? Yeah. And so that's where the emotion definitely is part of that. But if we just focus on the emotion, we're not gonna, gonna get there because part of it is also recognizing in that person what you see in them, you also share and we're, you know, similar. And, and then that painting becomes a portrait of them, a portrait of the moment, the moment and a portrait of your experience in that moment. So it's almost like a mm -hmm. threefold reason. Yeah. I like that. How does that, does that you know, kind of, um, you're asking me like the hard questions. That's but it's what I'm here for. It's called it. the undraped I artist. I didn't mean you're, you're literally taking like the, your first four hour podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, Rose Franson has a three. So if you could do four, we'd oh, be, okay. yeah, you'd break the record. <laughs> um, well, you know, a uh, thought that I had as you were, as you were talking is um, that, you know, I'd mentioned earlier that I feel like I need to get out of the way. I need to be good enough to get out of the way of the concept. But here's another way that I feel like I need to get out of the way, skill-wise, in order to capture the spirit in a person. I found, um, as you know, I worked from life for a long time. I don't even know if you know that I started using photographs in, when COVID started, but I did. Um, oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I did. But, and- um, This is iced tea, by the way, it's not wine. <laughs> <laughs> She's getting drunk on the podcast, people. No, I gotta keep my wits about me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, for 14 years, I didn't, you know? And when, when I first started just exclusively working from life, I was doing kids and everything else and animals and, you know, and it was really hard. But then as I got better at it, I started to be able to talk to my models a lot. Mm -hmm. And they, and it was almost, there were times where it was as though they weren't even posing, you know, it's just, it's like nonstop conversation and five minutes here and there, they sit in the pose they're supposed to, and that's about it, right? And then and only then did I really feel like I could get to know my sitter and really, really paint them. Yeah. And, you know, it was harder to technically, you know, get the length of their nose or the width of their mouth or, you know, the space between their eyes and their nose or whatever, or between their eyes. But it was, but it was easier to do what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So if I could get them to sit enough to get the technical stuff right and then talk to them and get to know them, and then you could focus on what are their mannerisms? Like, how do they, how do they display to the world? Like, who is this person? And then try and capture those moments where they're showing you that. Yes. Right. But yes. they don't show you, you that when funny. they're just staring at you for four hours. They just look like they just look like they're dying up there. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Anyway. And I think when someone knows that you're interested and you're interested in hearing their life story and you appreciate them, um, they will just open up. Right. Because we all tend to be guarded if we feel, especially if someone's looking at you, you feel like right. they're just judging spatial relationships and be very uncomfortable. But when it's um, when someone really wants to get to know you and they want to capture, like for me, I feel it's an honor to capture someone on canvas that they allow me to to look at them and be vulnerable in front of me. And um, because it's not always just showing strengths. Right. It's just showing truth and authenticity. And that has vulnerability. It also has genius. It has all of that together in that authenticity. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just such an extreme honor that I really want to capture that, you know, essence of who they are. Um, 
I remember having this experience um, painting with um, with some artists that came to town and we were painting this man at this um, Indian Pueblo and um, he was a very tough looking guy. He was a jewelry maker, did mm. beautiful jewelry, very stern looking. Um, and, you know, that was the first thing I saw. But then as I was watching him and seeing him interact with people and seeing this kindness in his eyes, I just could sense that he was maybe more of a spiritual person and a softer person. And he was like, then he wanted to emote to a bunch of strangers because there were about seven of us painting and we're in his house and everything. And, um, and so I, I saw that and I connected to that a little bit because, you know, sometimes I do that myself. I'm, you know, I've had to teach myself to allow my vulnerability to come out. And that's come through a quest to be authentic in my work and in my beingness, right? But um, I used to be one of those people that would be like, yeah, I'm fine, I'm, you know, it doesn't bother me, I, you know, I'm good, and and just not open up about things. But, I, and I, I recognized that because I too have felt that way, and I recognized he was feeling uncomfortable with these people looking at him. And so I knew there was more to him. And so I started talking to him during the breaks and I saw him relax. I saw him looking outside the window. His whole facial expression changed when he looked outside on the landscape, a landscape probably that he loves and has grown up around. And so as I connected to that in him and also how it was similar to that in me, the portrait took on a different emotion and a different, um, and I think, again, it captures the emotion, but it also goes further and, and pulls out his essence of something, yeah. you know, something that's um, inherent to him. And when I showed him the painting, this, this guy, he was just, he was really moved and he almost looked like he was going to tear up a little bit. And his, I can't remember if it was his girlfriend or wife was there and she's, she's like, honey, she captured like your spiritual side. And it was when I looked at the painting on its own, I almost felt like I was looking at a, a painting of like an apostle of Jesus or something like that. You know, it had a spiritual sense to it. And he's like, you captured a side of me. That's very, my very important true side, but I don't really show it to people I don't know. Hmm. And at that time, and this was like, you know, eight years ago or something, I totally connected with that because it was something I didn't show until I felt safe around someone. And um, so I, I gave him the painting as to me, it was like for him to remember this, who he is. That's right? nice. And, myself, and he gave me a beautiful, like um, silver hand car, like um, created bracelet that he did as a jewelry smith. And, um, and it was a beautiful moment. And I think that's what painting does. It reminds people who they are when we paint their portrait and who they are beyond the surface of things. But if I'd gotten the nose or the eyes in the wrong place, he wouldn't have had that reaction because that would have gotten in the way. So I totally get what you're yeah, saying about right. we have to, we have to like initially get ourselves out of the way. But then I think we have to be vulnerable and allow ourselves back into the process and connecting with that human being in portraiture, at least. Yeah. So for those who are really new to portraiture, um, I would describe it like this. And, 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 and tell me if you're thinking of it differently or if you see this differently. But to me, emotion, mm -hmm. when you're capturing emotion, it's, it's, it's something like lifting the brow ridge and to create sadness or, um, you know, or lowering it to create anger and, you know, just it's relatively obvious things. But when they're gazing out the window at a landscape they love, it's all there's like a lot of times it's a stare, but there are subtle, subtle, subtle differences. Yeah. Very subtle things that happen in their face that you almost can't define as an emotion because it's not sadness or happiness or joy or it's like very yeah. subtle. And it's those things that you have to capture to really get the person, the spirit of the person. Yeah, to me, that's um, how you said when someone looks at a landscape or they have something that triggers and ignites their their spirit, right? The essence of who they are it reminds them who they are and why they're here and what's important to them, what's meaningful to them. Sure, as an artist, all we have to convey that in a painting 
is brushwork, is color, is lifting the brow a little bit, is the, but it's so subtle and it's not universal to everyone, like where the brow might lift, where things would ha you know happen. A lot of times to me, it has to do with capturing light. Again, capturing the way the light falls on something or so falls across someone's face when they are having that emotional experience or they're that having that spiritual recollection. Um, the way the highlight might glaze across the eye because a highlight with an eye that's slightly watery yeah. will have a different look. And so if they're feeling um, uh, a pull at their spirit, which is to me kind of like the catalyst for feeling emotion, right? Um, all of that can be very unique to them. And it's like, there's even a whole science of micro expressions that people yeah. use in, in government. And I think artists would probably be like so naturally good at that. Yeah, that's a good point. I wonder. Because you know? that's what we're doing. We paint micro expressions many of the time, you know, and that to me is just so fascinating to see on someone's face um, when they're talking about something that's meaningful to them or even something that's challenging. Yeah. You know, and, and the person isn't even aware. Mm -hmm. Like I even remember when you first told me about your your challenges you went through medically and then you ended up sharing it on stage when we were demoing together at Portrait Society. But when you were first telling me, like you had so many like I, I could have seen like maybe fifty different emotions pass across your face, different things and you're recalling that, you know, and it's just it it's what makes us human and it's what makes us connected to each other. And it's just that to me, like is one of the main purposes of painting someone. And um, so, yeah, so we have to deal with the, the technical side of it, but it, you know, one of the things that's fun to do, and especially since I've been doing some like Zoom um, online workshops, you know, since COVID, uh, I'll film my demos in high definition and get really close up and, you know, have the eye flushed out, have the highlight, everything kind of flushed out, and then start playing with the micro expressions. And sometimes it can be just an edge quality or, you know, completing a rhythm or, you know, you know, little things. And it looks like the emotion in the eye changes. And I've had students comment, they're like, it looks like the eye is changing mm -hmm. when it's really little subtle shifts around the eye that create that. And sometimes it has to do with movement, like you said, of the muscles. Other times it has to do with light, because I always think that you know, capturing the way light is falling on something, capturing a sense of light is the most important part, right? And it's, and there's two sides to it, capturing the physical light, how something falls, you know, how the light falls on something and, or cascades across a face, but capturing the inner light as well. And hmm. I remember Richard used to say, you know, you only need to paint one, learn to paint one thing and that's light. And, and we were at the Putney Painters all painting together and he said, and I'll prove it. And he turned off the light. He's like, is there anything? <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so great. And so, yeah, that's true. So he's like, don't think about painting this person or painting this chair or painting these flowers. Paint the light and how it's falling across something. And, you know, to me, I love all like the, I love color temperature and light and how um, light reflects, the, you know, the luminosity and the colors are around us. And it's very fascinating to me in skin tones. But all of that to me is pointing the way to the inner light of the person. That's what I really want to capture. Yeah. You know, all the technical stuff. And what about, Again, what about that, the, this idea <laughs> of um, bringing more than what you see to it? Uh, you know, cause you mentioned the light falling across them. Do you feel like it's the job of the artist sometimes to say, okay, here's the character of the person here's what I want to capture. I'm not seeing it right now. So how can I, how can I make it happen? Maybe I change the flesh color a little bit. Maybe I change yeah. the lighting a little bit. Maybe I choose a different background. I mean, do you, do you think about those kinds of things too? Yeah. And I think sometimes when you're painting a model, you'll see flashes of it, but people don't normally stay in that state unless no. they're an actor and they can. And sometimes I've painted someone who's an actor and I'm like, is this girl okay? Like, you're crying. Are you okay? She's like, no, no, no I was doing that for you, you know? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's a blessing because I've never had that. It makes it easier. Um, but I look, you see moments of it. And we see that every day in people, right? Where someone's vulnerable, usually. Yeah. And you see this emotion and they kind of like guard themselves, right? But then I try to put that in the painting, that that quality. Because, and I try to look for it in the in the model. 
the subject and I try to search for it and pull it out in myself as well. Mm -hmm. Because again, the painting is also a portrait of you and your experience of this person. And so I feel like every once in a while I've been in a session where maybe there's a lot of people, maybe it's an open studio where I'm not teaching or, you know, I don't have the luxury of going up and talking to the model and maybe they don't want to engage, right? Mm -hmm. And um, with anybody, sometimes models will, you know, will leave and, and, and want to take a break. And that's happened to me very rarely. Most are really interested in the artist process or artistic process or our artists themselves. Um, but when that happens, I feel like you have to excavate that within yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and find, it's almost like a bit of a treasure hunt in the model, finding what's beautiful technical wise, um, the, you know, the way the light's falling or maybe the edge work or the color temperature or something. But then goes back to what I was saying, you know, you, we need to embody the emotions that we want to convey. Right. And kind of get ourselves in that state and then it it just it comes out in the painting yeah i love that that's a really good conversation so you mentioned richard smith more than uh once so what is your relationship with richard smith and what part did he play in your education yeah um well you know a lot of people think i studied with him longer than i did i met him well, I met him in 2003, but I didn't go out and paint with him until 2010. Okay. So, um, and then, you know, he became a mentor and we, you know, became close friends and you really like family, um, over the years. Um, but yeah, I, like most artists had, uh, got all a primo when I was younger and, and there was so much wealth of information, you know, someone being completely uncensored and generous with the amount of information and knowledge they had. And, uh, it, that kind of became my textbook as it did, you know, for many other artists. I was living in California at the time, you know, hanging out with friends there. We would all paint together. Um, you know, people, you know, like Jeremy Lipkin, Joseph Jodorovich. I watched part of Joseph's podcast and he talked about that time too, you know, mm -hmm. it was pre-social pre media. I know you and I are about the same age, mm -hmm. so there's not a lot of, there's records of that. Some of it's on Facebook, but it's like, um, and we would just, you know, a huge group of us and Aaron Westerberg and different artists, we would hang out and we would paint and hire a model. And then we talk about art for like hours afterwards, you know, over beer at, you know, the local pub or something, or we'd have like a dinner party and watch a Richard Schmidt video and pause it like every five minutes being like, oh, did you see how I did that? Like, look at that. How did you mix that color? How did you do this? You know? And, um, and we actually all saved our our money and went to when he was having his first retrospective show um since we were artists at the butler institute and this was in 2003 and we all went out there as a group and he sat and he talked with us privately and you know we met him and got our book signed and and it was the first time i had seen originals and it was just it was an incredible experience and learned so much and again he's just such a generous person and then in 2010 um it's actually a really funny story <laughs> that i that I remember when I told him because um, so in well 2009 we kind of ran into each other again at the weekend with the masters event I wasn't teaching then but I was there um, and some of my friends were teaching and you know we all had dinner together and he told me like oh you know I'd love to see your artwork I'd love to paint you sometime I was like yeah I was just he was just being polite right I just didn't um, and then pretty soon after that I entered portrait society um, with the double portrait of Jane Seymour's daughters and um, got in and he he actually called me on the phone and the funny story is that it was right before I was going to the convention um, and you know it, it was my first experience being finalist yeah and uh, my mom was actually in the hospital for the first time since she had given birth to me um, because she just she was just sick and they might, they were maybe going to need to operate. And so I was there sitting at her bedside and I should preface my mom, every time I would come home, like from college or even when I was living in California or come visit them for Christmas, she and I would watch Richard Schmidt videos together because she understands about brushwork and color temperature right. and she did art, but like not professionally. Um, so, you know, uh, anyways, so I was sitting there with her on sitting on the hospital bed and my phone rings and I usually look at who's calling but I thought it was my dad calling because you know we're there and I just picked up the phone and put on speakerphone I said hello 
And it was Richard's voice, which of course I knew and my mom knew from all the many times we, you know, watched the videos. And he said, is this the Michelle Dunaway? And I was like, geez, you must have been starstruck. I more felt like I was going to have a heart attack. I was like, what? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and I looked at my mom and she's like this, you know, and he, and he proceeds to tell me that he saw my painting online and that just that he thought I was a magnificent painter. And he went on to tell me all this stuff that I was just like out of body experience thinking, I can't believe this artist I've admired for so long is telling me how much he likes my painting and how skilled he thought I was. And, and, and he said, yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, so uh, he said, I'd like to invite you to come out and paint with me and Nancy in my studio. And I was like, thank you and he's like if you have the time huh. and I'm like, yeah so, you know that's fine to just kind of be normal on the phone and not be like oh, my God. <laughs> and um and i look over at my mom while i'm having this like oh thank you for calling me it's so not you know and i look at my mom and she's just in the hospital bed going like you know <laughs> just can't contain herself Long story short, I hung up the phone. The surgery was she was supposed to have three hours from then. She didn't need because she kind of miraculously healed up and the infection went away. And they said, yo, you don't need the surgery. And she went home. Wow. And so I told Richard, I'm like, you that phone call, you healed my mother. Wow. <laughs> you know, he like changed my life, but healed my mother. So well, and I now already... you can leave without the stress of leaving your mom. Sick. Exactly. Yeah. If I wasn't going to go. I wasn't going to go. And you know, you have to be in attendance. I mean, now I realize they would have probably been fine with me not because of the circumstance. But I was thinking I was like, going to have to give up being finalist. And I was, I was going to stay there being the only child. But, um, but yeah, so it was incredible. And then I went up there and studied with him and he and I just hit it off. Like we, it, Nancy says we have a lot of this similar um, kind of temperament and and you know confidence in painting and inquisitiveness and like we like the same music we just it, we just hit it off like it, very much and and i remember one of his daughters saying to me um and this was before he died when we were sitting at portrait society saying you know he thinks of you like a daughter and that was just it meant wow so that's much. really nice yeah and we talked a lot during covid and we zoomed and you know um and i saw him right before covid and and you know, he has a new a portrait book that's going to be coming out later this year that he was working on in the last years of his life. And he showed me all the paintings, stacks of paintings that I've never seen before. And it, so there was so much I learned from Richard. I mean, I had already, you know, I met him when I was older, so I had already um, established my style. And so it wasn't so much that kind of stuff that I learned, but I feel like I learned so much of the heart of being an artist and how to work with models and how to just have, like he became like a kid when he was in front of a model hmm. or a landscape because, and he wasn't like rigidly trying to create a painting that he thought was good, right? Because he was, he really embraced more of the spiritual side of it to me rather than the ego. And he'd be like, look at the light on that landscape. Isn't that the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? Or look at this model and their life story. Isn't that fascinating, you know? And that like childlike inquisitiveness of capturing to me, and that's like capturing the inner light mm -hmm. of the subject, whether the subject's a landscape. One of the first times when I was over at his studio, he set up flowers and I'm not a floral painter. I've done like one mm -hmm. floral. And um, so, you know, we're setting it up and there's a few other artists there. And I'm looking at the flowers and I'm like, I don't really know what to, I mean, I, I'm inspired by flowers, but not necessarily to paint them. And he passes by and he said, oh, look at these little flowers that are just budding. He said, flowers always reminded me of children's faces. Hmm. And he said that to me and I looked at the flower and it took on a whole different um, viewpoint to me. And I remember I set up my thing and there was this little tiny flower like just blooming. We went to lunch and came back to paint and that flower was drooped over. Kind oh, of whoa. And it's like, I saw the emotion in the flower, which is just, I never thought I like through his perception, it helped me to see that any subject, um, there's that, um, just, um, beauty and inspiration in any subject.
Yeah. And you can always find that light. Um, hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. What an opportunity. First, you come from California with that powerhouse crew and then get an opportunity to study with him. That's really amazing. And what, where did you study art originally? What was the school you went to? So I originally went to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, and I went there when I was fairly young. I had just turned 20. Most of the students ages there around 30, 27 to really? 30, you know, and they've usually done like other kind of, they're going more for like a graduate kind of program. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just kind of naive to how hard it is to get into and was accepted and went and, and you know, I really, at that time, I didn't know you could be a fine artist. So I want, went to school to be an illustrator. I really hmm. thought I wanted to illustrate books. Um, I was actually thought I wanted to illustrate comic books, things like that. I was really into doing like the figure drawing and, and stuff. And I just thought that that's what you had to do to have a profession. And then, um, you know, changes took place in the school and I ended up, you know, leaving. I know it's back to like a traditional way of teaching, but it would kind of went very like avant-garde for a while. And um, I went back to New Mexico and I was doing like some sculpture and I got a sculpture commission on the East Coast and I went to do that. And I walked into the Met for the first time and saw like mm. the sergeants and Cecilia Bowes and stuff in the American wing. And gosh, I just felt like I said this before. It was that feeling of like when you first go off to college and then you come home and you're in your mother's kitchen and you feel like, oh, I'm home and your first time away from home. I felt that going into the Met and being around these painters that I admire to this day. Of course, like Sargent is my ultimate and, and Cecilia Bow too. Um, and I just knew right then I was like, I was enchanted by seeing the brushwork in person, the colors in person, um, just the way they conveyed form. And I knew that was exactly what I was going to be spending the rest of my life doing. Mm. That was just, it just ripped my heart. Um, mm. You know, speaking of ripping your heart, you know, I shouldn't even admit this, um, but the only time I've ever gotten emotional and actually cried in front of a painting was in Boston, where I wish I remember the name, but it was John Singer Sargent's painting of the family of girls and the two urns, those big yes. urns. And the boy the daughters, yeah. Yeah, and the urns were there with the painting. Yes. And I was just, I was, I was floored. I mean, I can't even tell you. I was. It was something about having the actual urns that were in the painting next to the painting. Just almost, it felt almost like standing in his studio. It was an incredibly, yeah. um, almost spiritual experience. It was really cool. Yeah. Um, and I'm not even. I mean, I'm a Sargent fan, but it's not like he. He's not my favorite artist, but there was just something about it. It's just like wow. Yeah, it's an amazing painting. No, there's that. Yeah, I remember seeing that one in person, especially having having them the vases there. That was that was really incredible. And I think the one that really struck me that I saw at the Met that took my breath away was this painting of William Merrick Chase, mm. because it was like him painting another artist, looking at him as he's painting him, and like I was an artist too, and it was just like there was so much, so many layers in that. And how he painted the palette and another artist in a moment. Um, I didn't know he worked in a lot of layers. Um, yeah. He did. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Well, but okay. yeah, that, that painting and, and I mean, Boston Museum of Fine Arts, they've done an amazing job. It's one of my favorite places to go because they've color corrected all the lights to where you see how much color is in Sargent's paintings. You know, we think of it as more toned down, but when I was doing a master copy there, um, and this one I actually did, um, oh, <laughs> I'm reversed, here we go, um, that I did there from life. Um, oh, they, really? Let me sit in front of the painting. And I did this as um, a preliminary to uh, the Richard Schmidt painting because I was out there, you know, working with Richard and kind of knew how I wanted to do the lighting. And then when I saw this painting, I asked them, you know, you know can I do a study of this? And it was fun because... You know, speaking of the painting that moved you, it's right next to it, um, kind of just a, a across the room. And they were having a day. It was it was just a fun, spontaneous thing where they were having a lot of grade school children come in and their teachers were having them sit there for maybe about half an hour sketching the sergeant painting of the four daughters. And then at the end, like and there were many different classes, probably from the same school, because every half an hour they'd change shifts, different age kids would come in and then they'd have them get up there and stand in the places of all the people in the painting. Mm -hmm. That's and, like cool. imitated. And I started painting this 
And then pretty soon I looked behind me and all these little kids were, wa were watching me paint and they kind of moved over and they started sketching me painting. And some of the kids came up and the teacher was like, oh, I'm sorry, don't bother her. And I was like, no, 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 please, please. You know, I was more interested in giving that, like, I would have loved to seen someone paint. Like, oh, yeah. That, well, you know, and these kids were like seven, eight years old. And they were like, you know, how are you doing this? And, how, and I showed them my palette and I let some of them make even some little strokes on my painting. And it was like such a great educational experience. And I love that about that museum because they are really about educating artists and allowing artists to paint there. You know, I didn't know that. Outside. Yeah, I wish I knew yeah, that at the time. Yeah. Hmm. They kind of vet you, but it's like, yeah. Oh, they do vet you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You can't just walk in with your paints, yeah. Yeah, I don't even know if I had my painting paints with me at the time, but. Well, let's look at some of your work. Um, uh, this is, of course, uh, Richard Schmidt. Um, and is there anything, well, I'm going to start with a couple of my favorites. First of all, I want you to talk a little bit more about this because this painting is just gorgeous. Um, and you already mentioned that it was in the Porch Society of America competition and it won, um, it was in the, uh, it was a finalist. Um, yeah. What did you end up winning? Do you remember? I think exceptional merit. Exceptional merit. I'm trying to remember the names of the yeah. yeah. Um, and for those listening, and that's when they only have sixteen finalists. Sixteen, so. they got as low as sixteen. I didn't know that. Yeah, wow. that was back in two thousand ten. And it, you know, I I was very naive to. I understand, of course, you know now or even a couple of years later, that is like the Academy Awards of portrait painting. But I was very naive to the fact I was just like I did this painting. Um, I remember taking it to California because Jane had wanted to see it. It actually wasn't a commission. And um, I was painting with Jeremy in his studio, finishing it off. And he's like, you should enter that in Portrait Society. I was like, oh, okay. And I entered it. And then when they called me um, to say, you know, oh, congratulations. I was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> and he was like, the guy was like, and it was Gordon Whitmore. I remember he said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. There were 4,300 something entries and we chose 16. Worldwide, like, worldwide. Oh, my God, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I didn't realize the, the magnitude of that competition. Um, kind of glad I didn't realize because I don't know if I would have had the nerve to enter at that time because um, I was still feeling like, you know, we go through stages where we think I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough, you know, and I was struggling with that. Mm -hmm. Now I've just embraced that like, oh, I'm on a journey of learning and, you know, I'm not where I want to be yet, but I'm better than I was. And so that's kind of just you make peace with it and grow and learn. And I love like Michelangelo's quote, it, was it 78 or 87 where he said, I'm still learning. Oh, I didn't know that's that. Um, so, so yeah, this painting, it started, um, back, I met Jane Seymour uh, and these are her daughters and met her back, gosh, when was it? I think back 2003 or something like that. And, um, she happened to come into class when I was doing a demo once she's a watercolor artist and, um, and popped in and she was like, oh, you know, I'd love, you know, if you'd ever teach private lessons to come over to my house. And, and I was like, yeah, great. And I was actually, um, you know, I put no stock in celebrityism. People are just people to me, but I, she was actually someone that I, I loved some of the movies she did uh, were some of my favorite movies and her characters. And so I was a big admirer of her, just like I would be of certain authors, people that have had an influence in your life. Like it's a huge fan of like Dr. Quinn and stuff. I didn't tell mm -hmm. her that when I first mm -hmm. met her. Course, you know, I've told her now because we're good friends, but um, that, uh, you know, when I was a 20 year old in art school and the youngest person there and one of the only girls pursuing art, you know, I would watch that show and be like, I can do it. I can do it. You know, like I can be tough and, and, and go into the unknown territory and do this. Um, and so it was, it was nice to meet her and she has such an enthusiasm for art. Um, in fact, almost never met someone with such a determination and because I remember giving her a lesson once where she was getting her hair done to go to the Emmys and she's like still wanting to paint she's like wait I'm gonna get into my dress in a minute because I want to finish this painting you know like the really strong desire to paint and learn and just her she loves John Singer Sargent she has just such a such a passion and enthusiasm for the same type of art I do and so one day she said, hey, why don't you invite some friends over? My my daughters are going to be in town and, and we can set up and paint them from life. I said, fantastic. 
and she said, and I'll get some vintage clothing, you know, and they like, we came and um, at the time she was um, married to um, uh, James Keach, the director. And so we had, he had like film crews, there's footage of this somewhere. And it was like me and um, Jeremy and some other artists. And so we just kind of all went over and we painted the each daughter separately from life. Um, and then we did like a photo shoot with them. And while they were in the house and they were moving the whole time, they were just like talking and interacting as sisters. And I just sat on the floor and I remember while everyone was milling around taking pictures, like I loved this viewpoint. There was something about the light wrapping around them. And so I just sat on the floor and I just like took a lot of pictures from that viewpoint. And it with my old like me three megapixel camera, which was so huh. advanced at that time, 2003. <laughs> and, um, and didn't really think about it, didn't do anything with them. And and, um, and Jane and I got to know each other over the years and developed into a friendship where we would just paint together. And um, and then I had moved back to New Mexico and I was just kind of like figuring out like what I wanted to paint one day. And I ran across, you know, these pictures on an old disc when I was kind of going through like my computers and stuff, you know, when you move and you find things. And I was like, oh, I think I'm gonna start this painting. And, um, and so I just started working on it. And one of the things that it, it, I, I took a lot of photos, but what I did was I watched them together that day because a sister relationship is rather fascinating to me because I'm an only child, any kind of sibling relationship. It's just because it's not something I've experienced. I have best friends that I call sister and it's like, like they're like chosen family. But I watched as they, they have very distinct personalities. Katie in front is, very direct and um, kind of bold. And Jenny is more shy and introverted, but also very sweet natured. And both of them are very kind. And so I wanted to really capture who I felt they were by observing them and also how they interacted with each other and how they kind of sat close together. There was just something fascinating to me to that. And so there were a lot of great pictures to choose from. And, and I had my, original paintings from life of them in the same outfits, you know, in similar lighting to use as kind of like a guide as well. Um, but then I really wanted to focus on like their unique personalities at the same time as their relationship. So that's kind of how I developed this painting and um, huh. entered into portrait society. And that's, you know, that's when galleries called me up and I've just been in some galleries and gallery shows before then, but um that's when I was like contacted by a lot of people and uh, I showed Jane the painting and she bought this. It hangs in her house and it was, the, I think she owns seven paintings of mine. Now. Wow. What a great client that was one that she has a couple. She hasn't commissioned ones that I've just done. Like I was going to take this to a gallery, but if I'm painting someone, I know I always give the family first, right. you know, right. prior refusal. So, and um, so that's kind of how that painting come, came. Oh, about. that's great. It's just a gorgeous piece. Um, okay, so another one you did was this one. I'm not, I didn't, I haven't seen a lot of your landscapes, and this is just gorgeous, called Alaska Spring. Thank you. Yeah, it's, is this plain air? Yeah, so this is, well, I did a plain air of this, and then this I supplemented in the photo because this is a little bit of a larger Oh, painting. yeah, it's big. And it was also from a vantage point I couldn't get to. I was on a tram, and I, I went up the mountain, and I spent, um, so I grew up in Alaska. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't know that. But, yeah, I grew up there till I was 13 from two age, like, one and a half to 13, and loved it. It was just it was such a magical place to grow up. And then we moved away when I was 13 and I hadn't been back there until I um, decided to take a trip in um, 2013 and I've gone several trips. So this isn't that old of a painting, but I went back in 2013 for the first time, rented a cabin in the middle of the wilderness and spent five weeks out there by myself. I had a bunch of friends that said, oh, I want to come and paint. And I was like, no, this is very like, I'm going back into my childhood here. It's very goldenized in my mind, especially because I left there before, you know, I really, really was a teenager and I just wanted to be immersed in that beauty. And so, um, I just went around, I did landscape painting, um, saw animals, some closer than I had planned, really? <laughs> such as like a bear and a moose. I was, I, I was at my little cabin and was getting out my stuff out of my car. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's like the biggest brown van I've ever seen. Like I thought it was really tall and it was a mother moose 
with her baby and I just slowly backed up because they can get very violent. And wow. at one point I pulled over, like I was driving one day, actually it was this day, I had taken the tram up Alaska Ski Resort, taken my paints, did a sketch as close to this as possible from life, from like the, the platform that you can see. This was about three quarters up the mountain. And I took a lot of pictures of this on the way. And so I did as close as I could to get all the colors and everything. And then I, because of course, like the blue shadows, those don't show up in the photograph. You know, uh -huh. photographs will lie to you. You have to do a life study to kind of know where they're lying to you. So you can change that. And so, and then I did this using my, um, you know, my plain air and then, and the photographs. And then when I came back down from here, I'm, I'm driving back to my cabin. I pulled over at the side of the road because I was getting repeated texts and I thought it was family because like I hadn't, you know, so I pulled over to look at my text and kind of had my window rolled down. And I looked over and there's like a black bear right there. Oh my gosh, you gotta be <laughs> kidding me. I was kind of looking out my window and then I realized I had just bought a hamburger to take from the resort to take back with me and it was sitting right there and he could probably smell it. But he looked at me and I looked at him and he ran off in the other direction. So oh my gosh. Like, yeah. Um. But yeah, so Alaska is a place I've gone back there 2014, 2015. I planned to go back in 2020, but then COVID hit. And so I'm hoping, my schedule's way too full this year, but I'm hoping to go next year and really spend some quality time. And, you know, when I went back in 2014 and 15, it was to um, photograph some of the native people there and that culture, because although I'm not, you know, Native American Alaskan, in, in some of the tribes there, I grew up with that. And I grew up with, you know, seeing like the artisan and the crafts, crafts work and the, and, and the fur sewing and all the stuff that's very indicative to Alaska. And it ha holds, like, it feels like it's part of my heritage yeah. just from growing up there. And so I've painted some of the, the native children from there and plan to do many more paintings. Do you have um, some of those here? Um, I do. There's one, if you go up right there with this the, one, this, Alaskan doll. That's gorgeous. Um, so I went to the World Eskimo Olympics where you see a lot of the people from the northern tribes up like say in Barrow places. My dad worked up on the North Slope there. You have to take a plane to go up there. It's like winter, you know, 24 seven. Um, they come down with their regalia with, you know, wearing their, you know, the the way they sew the furs is very um, similar in historical context to maybe like our um, quilting mm -hmm. that has gone American quilting where all of the family members were get to, gathered together. They'd use like fabrics from different people's clothing and everything had meaning and you know that. So how they choose the fur, different areas from different animals or different areas around the face, different like they were explaining to me, there's only certain parts of the fur they use to do this. And all of the family members come together and sew this and the child will wear it when they outgrow it. It's passed on to the next child for generations, generations. Wow. It's a really fascinating. Thing. And That's so cool. when I went there, this one woman who is um, Deanna Holton, who's an amazing um, for sewer um, that she would make hats and different things. And um, she had this reindeer skin at her booth and I decided to buy it to take back to the studio. And, um, and then I got to talking with her and she was such a generous person and she was, I realize now she was the equivalent of Rosemary from Rosemary Brushes in the convention hall, kind of like the, the, the mother of everybody, like mm -hmm. everyone looked up to her and stuff. And so she sat down and she started showing me some of like events that she said, you know, normally people outside of our community don't see this. They're at the basket. And she's like, showed me, you know, videos of some of these feasts that they do things, certain family events. And this little girl came up to the booth and it's her granddaughter. And I was like, oh my God, I would love to paint your granddaughter. And I, I got permission from the um, WEIO World Eskimo Olympics um, to to set up and kind of photograph some people off to the side. And I, you know, I paid them and I, you know, said I would send them, you know, some a print of the painting and stuff um, just to get reference pictures for myself. Right. Because you can't, unless you go out into the Northern Territories on a float plane, you can't get these real, you know, indigenous people in their, in their regalia. And um, so this is from one of the sessions I did with her. And one of the unique things about this is that Alaskan doll was mine when I was younger. What? It's not something I did as a kid, but my mom bought it when I was about seven or eight. And I collected dolls at that time. 
And so it was displayed and it's, you know, um, all made from, you know, natural different, you know, suede and leathers and furs and everything. And I took that with me along with um, a little sealskin teddy bear. And don't get me wrong, I love animals. I'm all about animal rights and, you know, cruel, you know, cruelty against animals is horrible. But this is their culture and it's been this way for generations and they use every part of the animal. It's what it's in these cultures in the northern areas, you know, where they hunt for food and they don't let any part of the animal go to waste. It becomes their clothing. It becomes like everything is used. And to it's such a they have such a deep respect for the animals and, and how their relationship, you know, with that. And even she was telling me like on whale hunts, they don't go out and just try to find a whale and hunt it. They wait for the whale to come to them and offer itself up. Hmm. It's like there's a big respect thing that happens there and honoring of these ways of life. And and um, and again, I grew up with seeing a lot of this and was really fascinated. And I've always wanted to paint it, but I wanted to wait until I felt I wanted to wait until I had a certain skill level to where I could do it justice. I didn't want my lack of skill to get in the way of the message I was trying to convey, like what you were saying mm -hmm. earlier, trying to get yourself out of the way. And um, so I took this with me. I took this. It's a teddy bear, but it's made out of seal skin and it's sewn together and the little arms coming off because I used to play with that. And I took that in there in a painting I have yet to do is of her and her little brother in their parkas and she's mending the little teddy bear. She just took it up and started sewing it back together. And he's kind of crying and looking and it's like, uh, I can't wait to paint this, you know, hmm. and just letting them interact and kind of creating these moments. But um, that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. And just leave it to me to be while you're talking, just to be trying to imagine a seal skin teddy bear, like a little girl just playing with a wet teddy bear. It's, that's just what I'm picturing. Well, so, <laughs> I know, but that's just what I'm picturing somehow. This sopping no, wet seal skin. Wet. Rough like, and wait, wiry no. and silvery. They do know? dry them off. Like, I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see what else you got here. Um, and is this another one of that series? Of... Yes. Yeah, this, this is, is gorgeous. Girl. It's Alaskan um, Child, 20 by 16. It looks like she's wearing a fur coat. Oh my gosh. Look at that face. Yes. So it's just a portrait oh, was, with a fur, she fur coat. She was so precious. And um, her aunt was explaining to me that, you know, they use, and I, I'm going to probably get this wrong. And Deanna, who's an expert at all of this, who I'm friends with still, um, she'll probably correct me on this, but they use certain type of fur here. And I think it might be beaver or wolverine. It's something that when the, it gets wet with water, it won't freeze against the skin. Oh, like it's and it's not just that type of fur, but from a certain area on the animal's body. And um, and then usually it has like up here can be wolf or different um, type. And it's again from a certain part of the body for warmth. And so sometimes I'm going to do another painting of this little girl where you see more of her parka. It's almost like a patchwork. Again, it's very much like a patchwork quilt where there's different people, different parts taken from different animals that they've hunted mm -hmm. themselves. And it's all for like either warmth or safety or so it doesn't freeze against the skin. It all has a purpose, which is so fascinating to me. And in fact, one of the things I had planned to do when I went back in 2020 and I still plan to do it because Deanna and I have stayed friends and, and um, this isn't one of her grandchildren, but some of the other ones that I've painted have been. And she said, you know, come back and, and I have all these new grandbabies and, you know, come back and stay with us and, you know, paint members of our family. And I'd love to paint them from life. And I'd like to videotape her um, and eventually maybe turn it into an instructional video, but in vi videotape her like documentary style of like her talking about all of this, because the culture to me is fascinating. And part of like, I feel a calling to preserve it in paint mm -hmm. because you see a lot of Native American tribes, especially in the lower 48 area, you know, like represented but not sometimes, in, you know, I've seen like Bettina Steinke did beautiful paintings from Alaska, but I don't see that represented as much. And that's to me, like authentically part of what I grew up with. Yeah. You really want to honor that, those people and that culture. And there's about 12 or 14, I don't remember, different tribes that are very distinctive throughout Alaska. And, um, and they all have their different specialties and their artisan crafts and, and things. And so I want to really explore that and bring in some of that authentic. Um, and I wonder if that would, I mean, this is a little 
kind of a tangent here, but I wonder if that would fall under the Western art category. I mean, I think it should. I think of Western art, really, I don't think of it geographical location because they're, we're Native Americans on the East Coast, right? Right. So, but I think of like Western art as being more of a time period of discovering the West and kind of when we were introduced to these cultures. That's just how I've always seen it. That's what it seems like to be, yeah. Yeah, and so I think there's so much, you know, Alaska is such an important part of our culture as the United States and people going up there for, you know, the gold rush and then kind of, you know, being introduced to the native people out there and and being educated sometimes by how they lived with the land and they lived in harmony because so many people that moved out, it's a harsh country, mm -hmm. to, I mean, a harsh state to live in, yeah. but, you know, just country in the sense of the countryside. Right. And um, it still is if you live there, you know, it's, it's very much like back in, you know, front frontier days if you live in the bush i mean i grew up in anchorage and so it was like a city you know we went to the opera and to plays and you know it was like the symphony and you know it was very um you know the education was fantastic and very metropolitan but like you go out we go out to the kenai and then you're out there and there's bears and there's you know the salmon and, and there's you and you have to you know nature is dominant we're not the you know the most important thing out there and we have to respect that and i think that's what um, m many people learn from, and I respect in the Native American cultures just globally, is that how to learn to live in harmony with the land and how to live in harmony with nature and with animals and that deep respect yeah. for that. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing about about many, or maybe all Native American cultures. Um, yeah, I think we, did, we still have a lot to learn in that respect yeah, no about kidding. how to live with that. Um, okay, let's see what you've got here. So let's, I'd like to talk about this one because obviously, well, not obviously, but I would think this is a portrait of Richard Schmidt. It's 12 by 10. Um, and it's a uh, backlit. The first portraits I did. Is it? Okay. But I imagine it's somewhat sentimental. Well, yeah. So this painting, I'm glad you sensed that it had an emotional quality to it. It was very meaningful to me in many different ways. I did this painting back in 2011. And so I had only really known and been painting with Richard for about a year. And it was only a couple times a year. So we had had conversations about some art and different things. But um, this day, it was, uh, I remember it was during an event weekend with the masters that we were at in California and we were having lunch. And um, it was me and Richard and a couple other artists. And he started talking about just things beyond art that was fascinating to him. He started sharing some life stories. So he really shared some personal stuff and uh, really was kind of vulnerable, sharing personal stories of his time as a young artist, talking about things that were meaningful to him beyond art. And I was really just kind of getting such a strong sense of who he is. And I knew I wanted to paint this moment. And we were sitting at a table and he was he would be turning and talking to me and talking to the other people. And it was a very small group. There were just a few of us. And um, we we're tucked away in the corner at this restaurant. And I just like felt like I was getting to know him on a whole different level. Mm -hmm. And it was like the beginning of a really beautiful, close friendship. And so I knew I wanted to paint it, but I wasn't going to whip out my giant camera. And I wasn't going to try to take a picture with the phone and be disrespectful as he's saying something that's meaningful to him. And I really wanted to listen intently and be respectful and, and focus on what he was saying. But in my mind, I started doing a painting in my head. And I do this often when I can't take a photo of something mm -hmm. or pick I mean, sorry, I can't paint from life, but I know I'm going to take a photo of something is I pretended I was painting him from life in my head. Right. Yeah. And so I was I've noticing how you do, you do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cause it's a great tool and you, you know, you do remember and retain that information. So I was looking at the light coming around him and you can't really zoom in close, close on here, but um, I was seeing it from life, little breaks in the edges of violet and gold and, you know, very light blue, all in the same value, but different color temperatures, like the light kind of wrapping around his form. And that was fascinating to me. And so I was like painting that and of course, you know, going for the emotion and capturing his essence as well. But looking at the technical things that I knew a photograph wouldn't give me, right? A photograph would just, it wouldn't show any of that. 
So when I paint from life, I'm always initially going after the things that I won't get in a photograph. Because even if you paint, you only have 20 minutes to do a painting, you can take a photograph, supplement the drawing, but you have some values, some colors, some color temperature, some edge relationship established in the preliminary um, quick sketch. And so I did that. And I did that in my head for about 45 minutes. And I felt like I did this in my head and in, in my imagination in its entirety. And then when he was it when we were about to finish off with the lunch i said i brought i actually didn't ask him i knew he would understand i brought out my camera which was like a big camera one of the other artists was like dying laughing because like i'm trying to be subtle with this giant camera i brought it out and he didn't look he didn't turn to me he stayed just as he was and he was just my and i took a bunch of pictures and i said richard can do you mind if i paint and he goes i figured that was what you were doing so i wanted to stay natural was like do you mind if i paint you and he was like not at all and you know i gave him this painting as it hangs in his house as a thank you for all that he had taught me and um That's and he really, really nice. loved it he said he felt it really captured him and because i had painted it in my mind i knew where to put those little breaks in color and how to do those edges because of course in the can you know in the photograph and i have you know really like one of those cameras you can get it doesn't show any of that and it no. doesn't show the color in the darks and things. And so, um, and, you know, one of the things Nancy told me once, which was just a huge honor to me, she said he was Zooming with some students in England, like doing some kind of special presentation and talking about painting um, the color you put in the darks. And he used this painting as an example of how to do that, which I was really touched by. Um, oh, and again, you have to study. Yeah. Um, but you have to study visually and, and I'm so not, not surprised you do that seeing your paintings that you do that as well, because, um, photography is a great tool, right? But it's like a camera is going to lie to you about different things. It's going to push the contrast. It's going to take out the color in the lights, in the shadows, especially in the half tones. Um, it's going to treat everything with equal edges. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't want to be copyists, right? We're not like, mm -hmm. uh, my friend John Coleman always says, you're not copy, you know, we're not copy machines. We're, we're artists. And so we're interpreting life. We're not just copying it. And, um, and this was my interpretation of that moment. Yeah. And yeah. Well, it's beautifully done. Absolutely beautiful. And you mentioned John Coleman too. And I noticed you had a painting of him. It looked like you had a painting of Jeremy Lipking. Um, yeah. And it seems like you paint a lot of artists that you're either friends with and or admire yeah and i think actually um i love i like to paint people i know and i just happen to know a lot of artists right well yeah that's <laughs> but some of the other paintings are people that i know as well right. so um that was one that little one of jeremy is actually um when richard and nancy came out we were all painting at alexi steel studio and he set up jeremy to paint him and so he said that pose and then we were painting yeah oh is this the coleman one yes that's the whole, that's the first time I painted John and I've painted him several times since then. But this was during a demo for um, the museum in Scottsdale, the Western Museum in Scottsdale. And um, so Sue Lyon and I were painting, a, uh, doing a painting demonstration one evening there. And he posed for us. And it, it very similar to how you were talking about with your models is he, you know, moves and he was telling stories and and you know he's an artist too an amazing artist so it's like he would you know sit still when he knew we needed to to paint him but he's just such a great storyteller i mean yeah. he's someone that you just want to turn a tape recorder on when he's talking and just sit back and listen it's just he's just such a philosopher you know um but uh yeah so this was the first one i did uh, him from life it's really and beautiful. what's funny is is uh i didn't have time to finish the hat and i was like oh i'll finish that later and he's like please don't i love it just the spontaneity of how it is yeah it works it cool. works and you don't even notice it until you mentioned it that there's no top to it but you <laughs> you did sort of suggest the top like right right in here yeah yeah and i think that's it works beautifully thank you this was such a fun one to paint um if you saw it in person there's a lot of texture on the face like hand carried this like really nice expensive palette knife on the plane just to paint his mustache because <laughs> he's I knew got I was gonna some mustache that. that's a beaut he's got like he's a, yeah the mustache you know yeah and, and then at the end of the session i took a photo of him because i was originally going to paint in the hat but i left it just as it was i liked and i tend to do that with 
a la prima sketches, the authenticity of the moment, whatever you get finished, you know, that's, that's what it is. And there's something uh, beautifully and beautiful and real about that. Um, but I did do an, a drawing of him in the drawing section with the hat and still leaving it gestural. And, um, and then did another painting of him that it kind of more monochromatic. Okay, so here's the drawing, the cowboy artist portrait of John Coleman, 20 by 24. Yeah, that's yeah. great. And charcoal. Beautiful. Yeah. So, this and, is what I think you. And that mustache, that is something else. You know, I always wonder if people with big mustaches and big beards like that get bed mustache or bed beard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I like, is their mustache like sticking straight up in the air when they wake up in the morning? <laughs> What is that like? <laughs> He's someone you should have on the podcast. He's yeah, I probably person. will ask him to be on it. Portrait Society, and it was three hours, you know? So. <laughs> All right. But yeah, I really wanted to paint the feathers. I loved, like, the lost and found edges there. And, and still wanted to keep it looking like, you know, it's the greatest compliment to me if someone thinks it's painted from life. Yeah. Because even if I'm painting from a photograph, I've studied that person from life. I prefer to, you know, if I've... If I know I'm going to paint someone from a photograph, I prefer to do a study from life. Of course, that's always my choice. I mean, I would love to paint 100% from life, but there are just things I want to paint and moments that are transitory that I can't always paint from life. Right. And, and that's where I'll supplement with photography. Yeah. Well, so you mentioned the Porch Society quite a few times, and I know that you've been on the the faculty there for many, many years. How many years have you been on the faculty? Um, I'm trying to think of when I first demoed. So I was a finalist first in 2010. And I think the next year in 2011 was when I first demoed okay. with Sue Lyon. And then after that with David Casson, and then with you. And that was fun. When yeah, we that was a blast. Together. Well, do you, will you be there next year as well? I'm not sure, but very possibly. Yeah. Well, I hope you see you there. Yeah. I'm not sure if they've told everybody or anybody for that matter what's going on yet but it's always a yeah, blast and it, and it, usually, it is I, I probably will you know so one of the things that pre-covid you know my schedule was always scheduled out like two two and a half years in advance like i knew everywhere it was going to be and as much of a blessing as that is and i'm thankful and i get excited about these events and i love to go you know teach and travel and all of that i also realized you know I needed to keep some time open and needed to, and, and a little, there's things, there's things I want to do now in my painting. I want to do some bigger paintings. I want to do some paintings that might take months, really like some life, like huge, huge things that I'm inspired to. Some, I was just in France and I took some reference for a very large figure in the landscape painting that I want to do that might end up being like, I don't know, eight or 10 feet by. Whoa. Another awesome. six foot or something. Yeah. So these are things I've been wanting to do and it's just, you need time to do it. Mm -hmm. So I'm being very careful about what I commit myself to. Um, and I'll always travel and teach, but it's like, I just, and I need to kind of make time for family too. My parents are older. I like to, you know, I need to be available to yeah. them as well. And so that, you know, working at home and, and, you know, we live in the same town to where I can just, stop and, and be there if I need to. Um, but uh, yeah, but there's just things like I'm always wanting to grow as an artist and I usually don't talk about the things I'm going to do. I just kind of do them and let it speak for itself. But there's just new things that are just opening up for me that I want to develop. And I think there was something beautiful, you know, there were, there were for everyone challenges and gifts that came with COVID and lockdown and everything. And one of the beautiful things to me was taking things moment by moment. We had to because we didn't know whether things were going to be over in a month. I, I remember mm -hmm. thinking when it said, oh, it's going to be two years, thinking, oh, that's not realistic. And of course, here we are in year three. So um, it kind of forced you to live in the moment. And I was always, I felt pretty good at that. Um, but really just saying, like, I don't, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know if I want to do this in six or eight months and I'll see kind of when that, and I'm not talking about portrait society because especially them being a nonprofit and, and they're so into education. I always say, you know, yes, I'm going to do that mm -hmm. uh, because I really believe in their mission. You just mean like and workshops and stuff like that. Yeah. Like I've been, you know, teaching in Italy every summer for the past few years. And I love that. I love going to that school and someone asked me like, Oh, I'm going to sign up for your one next year. I'm like, mm, I don't know if I'm gonna have one next year. Not that I won't go back, but it's just, 
I'm not wanting to over schedule myself. I really want right. to kind of, I think COVID made us go inward and really think, okay, how am I spending my time? What's most important to me? And all of those things were really important to me and still are, but also, you know, family and also, you know, forging new ground in, in my art and flushing out some ideas that are going to take longer yeah. is equally important. And it's one of the things I love about teaching in Zoom because I can say like, oh, I'm not going to teach for a while. And then all of a sudden I see, oh, I have like a couple weeks here and I'll say, you know, it's coming up next month. I'm going to do a Zoom class. And then people sign up from around the world and we do, and I get to share stuff and help people. Um, but in a more spontaneous schedule than really having to plan it ahead. Because yeah. That's nice. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. <laughs> really well, because I'm extremely grateful for these opportunities. Like I always dreamed of, of traveling and painting as a kid. You know, I found like the first time I went to Venice, Italy, my friend, very old school, she had taken a picture of me on her digital, on her phone, but she printed out a picture and sent it to me. And I had opened up the picture and I had it sitting down and this is on Facebook or Instagram somewhere. Um, and I had it sitting and I was like at that church, the Santa Maria della Salute that Sergeant painted with the green door. Mm -hmm. And I was standing there with my backpack, you know, my painting backpack and just like so enchanted after being in Venice and visiting that church at the time, you know, where my, one of my heroes painted and stuff. And I later went back and did a painting from there as well. Um, but, uh, I had just been going through some old photographs from a photo box from when I was little. And I saw a picture of myself in Alaska at 10 years old with my backpack that I would fill with sketchbook and markers that my mom took at me on the driveway as I was walking out into the woods behind our house to go pretend I was traveling in Europe, being an artist. And I'm standing in the same pose. Wow, that's bizarre. The wind of my hair looks the same. And I was seeing, and it just happened to these, ended up kind of very serendipitously, you know, serendipitously or divinely appointed, like right next to each other. And I'm like, the dreaming and the coming true, you know? That is so and cool. So it, it was really cool. And I just had to say thank you, you know, that to me, like, um, to travel and meet other people and meet people from different cultures and get the honor to paint them and get the honor to, like, help other artists by teaching, help them kind of find their way and make their path easier. Because a lot of, you know, I had some really good teachers, but I didn't really have instruction in painting until I was maybe 30. Like a lot of it, I was just kind of figuring it out, trial and error. I just don't say I'm self-taught because um, even though I had established a sense of painting before, you know, and, and a lot of things before I took my first workshop, um, but to me, like self-taught means you've never read a book. You've never like been as looked at another painting, you know what I mean? Because we learn from everyone that's done it before us. And so, um, yeah, but a lot of like things took me years to figure out, you know, values and edges because I was just kind of like making mistake after mistake and finding my way through. And so to be able to teach someone and show them in 15, 20 minutes, how to do something that took me two years to figure out is such hmm. a joy. Yeah. Because then it puts them down their path faster and easier to kind of say what they want, they're here to say. Um, so that's something I'll always make time to do. But yeah, so that's great. On a well, tangent, but it's, <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm itching to start a giant canvas. Oh, I, <laughs> I even bought a easel, like a huge easel to really accommodate that. Yeah. You know, I love painting stuff. big, so I can relate. So I How got, do you think your crucifixion painting? Well, I'm actually doing two, and one of them is 13 okay. feet tall by 10 feet wide. And the other, wow. yeah, it's big. And Christ is eight feet tall. Um, and then wow. the other is Christ is life size. Well, he's my size, so he's six feet tall. Mm -hmm. And uh, the painting is about 10 by eight feet. Wow. Yeah, they're both big. Very cool. Yeah, a lot of work. It'll be, it'll be a while before they're done. But so one final question for you, yeah. um, for the aspiring artists that are going to be watching this or listening to this, what is one good piece of advice that you could give them? Hmm. It, no pressure. It could be a really crappy hard, piece. Of, yeah. It could be what a terrible piece of, of advice. <laughs> yeah. What's um, the worst piece of advice you could give? <laughs> just advice? to ease the pressure um, a little. That I could give too, you know, but 
I'd say best piece of advice, I'm going to give some practical advice and some philosophical advice, but it's like practical paint from life, draw from life as often as possible. Even if you, you know, take great photos and you paint from photos, you need, like for me, when I was learning, it was 80% from life, 20% from photos, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like, you always need to, you know, painting from life will tell you where the photo's lying to you and it'll show you what, right. We don't see like a photograph. People think we see like a photograph because we grew up in the photographic age, right? But how we see, we see more like how a painting that has like brushwork and edges, we see selectively. Yeah. You know, we, we, and you know, whenever I've had someone go, well, I'm not sure if I agree with that. I said, if you're in a crowded room and your wife, your child, your husband, someone you love walks in that room, what happens? All the periphery blurs. It becomes abstract. You zero in on that central focus point of what draws your eye and what's beautiful and meaningful to you. And that's what I'm interested in doing, painting how the human eye sees, you know? And the human eye doesn't seem like a photograph. A photograph has a hard edge everywhere. You know, a photograph um, loses some of the color that you see from, from life bouncing around, um, loses some of the luminosity. It's almost, you know, I kind of compare it to if you're driving down the road and you see a beautiful sunset, right? And you're looking through your windshield and then you lean your head out the door and the colors just come alive. That's kind of like, to me, like how the, it looks through the windshield is a little bit like a photograph, right? It grays it out. You lose saturation. Um, so I'd say paint from life as much as possible. Just that is the best training. Even if, even if you can't afford instruction, even if you're just going to like an open studio where you pay $5 to paint the model, you will create a wonderful education for yourself. For self-portraits, like Rembrandt did. Self-portraits, yeah. you know? You can, I remember once when I was um, living with a friend and she had a young daughter at, at the time and she would see me painting and she said, I want to paint too. And so she set up her, we set up a still life of her stuffed animals and she painted from life, you know, and she still draws to this day. And there's, you know, things that you learn, you're never too young to do that. And there's always something around your house you can paint. It doesn't have to be a person um, or like you said, a self-portrait. So that's one of the biggest things. And then I'd say inwardly, uh, mentally, spiritually, ask yourself, what is important to you? What is important for you to convey in art? And sometimes that can be a hard question for people to answer, um, but you can break it down to what is important to you in life? What are the things you notice? What are the things that make you catch your breath, that make you remember, you know, the beauty of why, like, of just being alive and and why you're here and your reason for living. Like those moments, which are often not huge momentous moments, they're little subtle moments throughout the day. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, an interaction with a person or family member or seeing, um, you know, seeing an animal in nature, seeing like, you know, behave a certain way that's touching, you know, like see, just not to get too sentimental about it, but just, just things that go like, oh, you know, we almost like can just breathe in. And, and to me as an artist, I'm always fascinated by the visual um, qualities of light, right? And we're always striving to capture that more effectively, more authentically in our painting. But those things, when they catch our eyes, then it ignites that light within our spirits. So like, and it reminds us why we're here and why we are so grateful Mm -hmm. to be here and be an artist and appreciate and, and, and life makes sense, so to speak, in those moments, right? And there are, to me, they're always little ordinary yet extraordinary moments of life. So that, to pay attention to that, and that's, there are some universal qualities in that from human being to human being, but there are unique attributes to each person when they experience things that, you know, we've all done it when we're in a group and we are having a moment <laughs> where we're catching our breath and no one else is moved by it. Those are the things that I think as an artist, you're supposed to pay attention to because those are the things you eventually want to get to painting and putting in your work, whether it's, you know, literally or metaphorically or whatever, because um, if you don't do it, who else is gonna do it? Right. Right? So those to me are, are the, the two most important aspects, I think of. Awesome. Yeah. That's nice. great advice. Great advice. Well, Michelle, it's been a huge, 
pleasure and honor to have you on my show. It's great to sit and talk with you because oh. we usually have time when we're teaching, but thank you. And I'm equally a fan of your work as well. So. Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends. And if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week. Thank you.